Waalaikum salam. <coughs> Waalaikum salam, brothers. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillah wa alhamdulillah Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in So alhamdulillah we're, Tonight we're in our 12th part In the tafsir of Surah Luqman And the last two nights uh, We looked at verse uh, 14 and 15 In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Took a short break from Luqman's story His statements with his son And Allah uh, chose to tell all of mankind about the relationship or the duties that uh, children have towards parents and of course parents have towards children <clears throat> and now Allah in verse 16 draws our attention back to the conversation of Luqman with his son uh, if you remember uh, in verse 13 verse 12 Allah introduced us to who Luqman was and the fact that he was given uh, wisdom uh, the fact that he was a grateful servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in verse 13, Allah told us that, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ That, um, and Luqman told his son, while he was giving a strong advice. And then verse 14 and 15, Allah took our attention to the entire concept of parenthood and uh, being a child, and of course the way we should deal with uh, one another. So verse 16, Allah brings us back to Luqman's conversation with his son. So Allah says that Luqman was saying, Ya bunayya innaha in taku mithqala habbatim min khardalin fatakun fi sakhra aw fi samawati aw fi al-ard ya'ti biha Allah inna Allah latifun khabir. So what we have to understand again that this is Allah telling us what exactly Luqman had told his son. So again, we see Luqman continuing the advice and he is addressing his son in the same way that we saw in the first time uh, in verse 13. Ya bunay, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la vulmun azim. Oh my dear son, don't commit shirk with Allah because shirk is the greatest wrong that someone can do. So now he comes back. Ya bunay, oh my dear son, if your deed, even 
if it be equal to the weight of a mustard seed, even if it be under a rock, aw fi samawat, or in the heavens, aw fi ard, or somewhere else scattered through the earth, yati bi Allah, Allah will bring it forth. Inna Allah latif al khabir. Indeed, Allah is al latif and Allah is al khabir. So we see here that Luqman is telling his son, explaining to him that there is absolutely nothing that is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know one of Allah's name is Al-Basir, the all-seeing. So he's telling his son, it doesn't matter what you do, whether I as your father am around or not, whether you do it in front of me or behind my back, I'm a human being. I only have two eyes and it's limited. I can't see past these walls. All of us are like that. We don't know what's going on in another room. We're that incapable as human beings. But whatever it is that you do, even if it's something small, the weight of a mustard seed, if it's underneath a rock, if it's anywhere in the heavens, if it's anywhere on earth, yati bih Allah. Allah will bring it forth. He is Ar-Raqib, the ever-watchful. But here, he, the Luqman meant, made clear, the two names that he used was, Inna Allah Latifun Khabir. Al-Latif, it means Allah is the most subtle in, in how he brings forth your deeds. And Al-Khabir, he is well aware of everything that you do. And remember in the previous verse last night, فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Talking to both parents and children, Allah addressed, whatever it is that you do, you will be informed about it on the day of resurrection. So here, uh, Luqman is explaining to his son the concept of al-muhasaba, accountability. This is why Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was known to have said to the people, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Take account of yourselves before you are taken account of by Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us elsewhere in the Qur'an, يَوْمَ تُبْلَىٰ Sarair. On that day, all secrets will be exposed. What you think is hidden, what I think is hidden, Allah will bring it out on that day because that is the day of judgment. Every single thing that we did, every single thing that we said, will be brought by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. So Luqman is advising his son, clearly explaining to him the concept of muhasaba, self-accountability, the concept of taqwa, right? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say regarding taqwa? That taqwa is to worship Allah as if you can see him, but that's not possible. You know that Allah is always seeing you. And Ramadan, the goal of Ramadan, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that perhaps you can attain taqwa. This whole month is there to train us. So let's say when we're fasting, nobody's watching, but we still continue to fast. Why? Because we know Allah is watching. So that's the concept that Luqman is now teaching his son. The concept that, don't worry, I'm a father, there's a mother. You won't always be in front of us 24-7. There will be times when you are alone as a child. You're our son, you're our daughter. You're going to be alone. You're going to be with your friends in school. You're going to be with your friends in, in college. You're going to be with your co-workers at work. Your father and mother's not going to be there to police you all day long, 24-7. However, the judge of all judges, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can see you. He can see exactly what you're doing, even if it be as small as the mustard seed hiding underneath a rock. He will bring it forth. Yati bih Allah. Inna Allah latifun khabir. And uh, so this is a very important concept that we have to teach our children. It's not about, and we, we mentioned this already uh, over the past few nights, it's not about you doing salah, hijab, siyam, Sadaqah, being good in front of your parents. Luqman is not teaching his son, hey listen, I'm your pops, this is what you gotta do, if you don't do this, I'm gonna be very angry with you, this, 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 that. He is teaching his son that Allah is the one who will judge you. 
no matter what it is that you do, small or big, he will bring it out and he will judge you on the day of judgment. And Allah is in Allah Latifun Khabir. And uh, the next verse, so this is very clear what Luqman said in verse 16. Now we move on to verse 17. Ya Bunay, again he says to his son, O oh my dear son, Aqimis Salah, Wa'bur bil ma'roof, Wanha anil munkar, Wasbir ala ma asabak, Inna dhalika min azmil umur. Establish the prayer, command what is good, forbid what is evil, be patient when trials befall you, and indeed these are the commandments of Allah, and it requires constant determination. So we see here, let's backtrack. What was the first thing that Luqman said to his son? Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah, inna shirk azim. The second thing, Ya Bunay, oh my dear son, no matter what it is that you do, even if it be under a rock, somewhere in the heavens, scattered around earth, Ya'ti bi Allah, Allah will bring it forth. He is not talking about actions, amal, or statements. What is Luqman focusing on when he's talking with his son? Aqidah, Tawheed, Iman, your creed. He's correcting or teaching his son the belief, the fundamental belief structure of Islam. The absolute first and foremost is La ilaha illallah. You have to know what is Tawheed and you have to stay away from shirk. Then he's teaching his son about the concept of, again, it's about Aqidah. Know that Allah is always watching you. Fix your belief, your inner self. For understanding Tawheed properly is purifying your inner self. Right? You understand what it means to believe in Allah, to worship Allah alone to uh, disassociate uh, with the uh, false deities that people worship. So he's fixing all that, aqidah, the creed, the concept of tawheed, the concept of iman, which is faith. All of that comes first. Now he goes to actions. You acquired this knowledge. You understand this concept of one Lord, one God. You understand that that God is ever watching you. Now you go to actions. The belief comes first. This is why when someone wants to become Muslim, oh, uh, this guy, of, this friend of mine from school, he loves the biryani my mother cooks, so now he wants to become Muslim. Islam has nothing to do with the biryani. Does your friend understand what Allah is? Or who Allah is? Does he understand the arkanul iman, the pillars of faith? If he understands the pillars of faith, there. Like you find sometimes, again, may Allah reward our young brothers and sisters who, uh, who do these things in Western lands. Many times in universities I have seen, they will do the fastathon. This year it's not possible because all people are doing online universities, right? Every single year I saw different MSAs from different communities and different um, universities. A lot of times they do uh, a Ramadan fastathon where a bunch of the non-Muslim students, they come and enjoy a day of fasting. Their fasting is not accepted. It's a, it's a nice gesture, but you have to understand, even though that person is fasting for a day, is he going to be rewarded by Allah? No, because the person doesn't even believe in Allah. The person is f uh, committing shirk. So you have to purify the belief first. And that is exactly what Luqman did. After the belief is purified, then he comes to action. And what is the absolute first thing he said in terms of action, in terms of amal? That, aqimi salah. Ya bunay, aqimi salah. Establish the prayer. The absolute first thing. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said in a hadith that's collected in the Sunan of a tirmidhi that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna awwala ma yuhasabu bihi al-abdu yawm al-qiyamati min amalihi salatuhu. Indeed, the very first action that a slave of Allah will be judged or questioned about is his salah. The absolute first question you and I as Muslims will face will be our, about our salah. فَإِنْ صَلُحَتْ If that salah is complete and done properly, it's established. 
فقد أفلح وأنجح then the person will succeed and prosper meaning he's going to go to Jannah وإن فسدت but if the salah is corrupt meaning incomplete, negligent did it some day, didn't do it another day did a couple of times a day, didn't do all five times فسدت it's corrupt, it's incomplete فقد خاب وخسر then that person he has failed and he is lost. So the first question you and I will be asked is about Salah. And this is why Luqman, after correcting his son's aqidah, belief, the very first action, he says, Aqim is Salah. This is your first obligation. If you truly believe in Allah, then pray. This is what a father is supposed to do. This is what a parent is supposed to do. He took things step by step. Many times parents want to teach their children all 20 things at once. This is not what Luqman did. He started with the absolute most important thing, which is Tawheed and Shirk. Then the articles of Iman, the concept of Iman. And then he goes to Aqim salah Then he says, so Salah is the first action. Then he says, Wa'mur bil ma'roof. Wa'mur bil ma'roof. Command the good. You learn Tawheed. You learn what is Shirk. You learn that Allah is always watching you, can always hear you, no matter what it is that you do in secret, He will bring it out. And there is a day of judgment where He's going to judge you. And you don't do anything that Allah hates. You learn the Salah. You do the, you establish the Salah. Aqimi Salah. Completely guard and establish it. Now after you have done all of this, the aqidah is taken care of, the salah is taken care of. Well, guess what? So aqidah, your own belief, you purify yourself. Salah, what is this? You perform your own ibadah first. You have done what is necessary upon yourself. The belief, the action, the most important act of ibadah, salah. Now do you just sit there and be like, you know what? They're not related to me. They're going to kill themselves. Let them drink to their death. Let this guy, whatever it is that they're doing, who cares what's happening in the masjid? Who cares what's happening across the street? Not my business. That is not how Islam works. And Luqman is teaching his son. You have tawheed. You stay away from shirk. You establish the salah. But guess what? That is not the end of your job as a believer. The very next, next thing, wa'mur bil ma'roof. Command to the people around you, after you yourself have understood tawheed, after you have understood the dangers of shirk, after you have understood that Allah is always watching, you got to be very careful. Stay away from things that Allah hates. And you have guarded your salah. Now tell this message to other people. A Muslim, a believer is supposed to lead by example. You don't just close your eyes it's like uh, they used to say, uh, you know, uh, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. This is not from Islam. Islam, when you see evil, if you hear evil, you have to speak against that evil. What bil ma'roof. Command what is good. You have to tell people what is good, what is right, what is fard. If somebody is missing salah next to you, you have to tell your Muslim brother or sister, brother or sister, the Salah is important for us. Is there a reason why you're not praying? Let's go back and see if you even have the proper understanding of Allah. Wa'mur bil ma'roof. So you make sure that you preach this message to other people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Quran, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Call to the path of your Lord. Bil hikmah. With wisdom. And we already covered the meaning of the word hikmah a few nights ago. But as a review, Hikmah is to say the right thing at the right time to the right people. hasana, And with good words of warning, with admonishment. Maw'idha. Same thing. Ya'idhuhu. Wa huwa ya'idhuhu. Luqman was giving advice to his son. So Allah says, Wal hasana, Good, strong admonishments. Call people to the path of your Lord. With wisdom and strong, good words of admonishment. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ If people are going to argue, and they will argue with you, when people argue with you, they don't want to follow the straight path. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ 
Allah didn't say pack your bags, throw in the white flag and run the other way. Allah said argue back with them in, a, in the right way, meaning with dalil, with evidence. Give people evidence. Somebody will say, you tell somebody, listen, brother, sister, the mawlid is a bid'ah. And he starts cursing you. You don't love the Prophet? What is this, this, that, that? Well, all the while he's wearing a gold necklace, by the way. But he loves the Prophet. And he wants to celebrate his uh, birthday, right? Supposed birthday. So then he's arguing, arguing, arguing. You have to argue back. Allah didn't say, turn, the, turn your back and run the other way. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ But argue back in a way that is better. What is the way that is better? With evidence. Show this poor Muslim who's misguided that what he is doing or she is doing is wrong. The right thing. Or the non-Muslim that comes who thinks that uh, there's uh, 300 some gods or that Jesus is a god, Mary is a god, or this, or there is no god. جَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Argue back in a way that is better, in a, in a way that is better, which is, of course, evidence. And Allah said in Surah Yusuf, Qul hadihi sabili. Tell to the people that this is my straight path. Ad'u ilallah. I call you to Allah. Ala basira. With evidence that you can see clearly from the Quran. You can go read the ayah yourself. I'm not making anything up. You can go read the hadith yourself. We're not making things up. Ala basira. It is dalil that you can clearly see with your own eyes. It's not some, ah, oh, the elders have said, I had a dream, my elders have said, the elders of the village, who are these people? Who are these elders of your village? Where are they getting these stories from? Where is, where is the evidence that I can see and read with my own eyes? Is it from Allah? Is it from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Or is it just some fake stories? So, ad'u ilallahi ala basira. Call unto Allah's path with sure, crystal clear evidence. Ana wa man ittaba'ani. I and all those who follow me. This is our methodology. This is our manhaj of wa'mur bil ma'roof. Telling people what is good. This is the way we do it. And again, we look at, let's say Imam Bukhari's example, we'll give it again. He even has the chapter title in, uh, in, in Sahih al-Bukhari. And he brings in all the hadith. Al-ilm qabla al-qawl uh, uh, wal-amal. Knowledge comes before speech and action. Most Muslims, they don't understand this. They think, let me do something, then later if I, I'll care to find out if it's right or not. But a genuine Muslim, a true believer, a successful believer, what does he do? He learns something first, then he goes and says or does it. So this is a principle. When you're saying, when uh, Luqman is telling his son, وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Command what is good. You have to know what is the good yourself. Luqman purified his son's aqidah first, his belief structure. You established the prayer. Then he said, وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ But we have a lot of people today. They still don't pray five times a day. But they're going to go correcting people. Come on, akhi. Come on, sister. Pray five times a day first at least. Learn Tawheed. Don't be busy correcting people. You don't, you don't even know anything yourself or practice it. The absolute first pillar of Islam, the first act of ibadah, which is Salah. You're not even praying five times a day. Why are you bossing people around? So Luqman taught his son structure. Their step-by-step -step process. Fix your own belief. Fix your own connection with Allah. Your belief and your Salah. Once you fix your own relationship with Allah, then you go tell people what to do. What murbil ma'roof. But we will find, so that's one extreme that we see in the ummah today. People themselves don't know aqidah. People themselves don't pray salah. But they will be bossing people around about what's right. Then we have the other extreme. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, brothers and sisters who understand. They're really striving very hard to make sure they don't fall into shirk or bid'ah or haram and things like that. They're praying, they're doing all that. However, when it comes to what bil ma'roof, they're completely silent. No, 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 I, I don't want to get into this. I don't want to say, but this is our communal obligation. This is the next natural follow-up. You have understood the aqidah, you have understood the salah, the natural follow-up, the very next thing you have to do is command what is good. Now, of course, Commanding what is good, we said the first principle, you have to do it, your, you have to have the knowledge about what is right. Then, 
العمل به. You do that right thing yourself first. Thirdly, you have ikhlas, sincerity, when you call people. It's not, as Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, if you're going to seek knowledge to beat down on people, don't seek knowledge. That's a waste. But if you're going to learn about Allah's deen to really teach it to other people and save them from the fire, that is the reason why you're supposed to learn. Not to beat down on people, not to sound as if you are uh, on top of the world and they're nobody. Like, let's say, even while, uh, you know, in my short two and a half year uh, time here, some, some brothers had said, you know, sometimes, Sheikh, we find you really soft. I said, why? Like, you don't really force it. I said, that's not from Islam. Sure, I'm the Imam of the Masjid. I can keep yelling at everybody all the time. The only time I raise my voice, alhamdulillah, is in the khutbah, right? We, 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 this is from the Sunnah. But when it comes to other time, you explain it. The person needs to understand it himself. What am I going to do? I mean, if I force him, fine, hey you, this is a bid'ah. And I'm the Imam of the Masjid, get out of here. You can't do a Mawlid in this Masjid. But then he goes to his own house and he does the Mawlid. How have I helped him? He has to understand why this is wrong. Why it is shirk. So of course, we'll see people wearing things, right? Uh, uh, wearing things that are shirk and this and that. Before I cut it off, I want to explain to the person why this is shirk. So that in front, I cut this talisman off, but then he goes home and he asks his grandmother for a new talisman. It's useless. It is pointless. It's not going to save him from the fire. A person has to understand why this is wrong. Why am I supposed to follow Allah? Why am I supposed to follow the messenger? Why are why is Allah and the messenger far more important than even my own parents, as we have already covered last night? Why is Allah even more important than my own mother, the woman who carried me, gave me birth and breastfed me? Why is he more important? A person has to understand that. And before moving on, this is something that you brothers and sisters have to understand. A lot of, and this is, uh, this is not directed at anybody from the community. This is for everyone, everyone living in our generation today. A lot of times as parents, you might think your son is praying five times a day. Your daughter's praying five times a day. Maybe perhaps she wears a scarf as some of, what, an, of an attempt to wear the proper hijab, but something is better than nothing, but it's still not all the way proper. But okay, she, inshallah, she's working on it. So you see these things and you think everything is fine as a parent. That okay, mashallah, my kid is doing, you know, he's praying, he's going to the lecture, she's doing this, she's doing that. But have you sat with your son and daughter and checked their belief? What did Luqman do? He is correcting and checking his son's belief first. There are people in this community, now I'm getting direct, the daughters might be praying five times a day. The son might be praying five times a day. And online, you see that same son and daughter writing about queer rights. So I can ask this father and mother, you are very happy that your son prays five times a day and your daughter prays five times a day. Maybe even wears the hijab. But do you see what your son or daughter does online? They participate in blogs that praise queers and support queers rights. If, if your son and daughter truly had proper belief in Allah, would they be going and, and supporting such rights of such a hideous thing? So this is the reality, brothers and sisters, that as parents, you think all is fine and dandy. You can never. I mean, it's the hardest job in the world. Once you're a parent, sometimes we're going to stay awake all night worried about our kids. That is normal. That I, I'm worried. Is my son being saved from the fire? Is my daughter being saved from the fire? So you have to check your children's Iman. I see you praying, but do you really understand Allah? I see you fasting with us, having iftar, waking up for suhoor, but do you truly understand what it means? Watch your actions, watch your beliefs, which even comes before Salah and Siyam. So Luqman, he was Al-Hakim as Allah said. He first focused on the kid's belief. Because if the belief is shaky, who cares if you're praying, fasting, telling people what's right? None of that will matter. Because your belief is shaky to begin with. Then you'll find young brothers and sisters, they'll come here, listen to Tawheed. They'll go somewhere else, listen to Bid'ah. They'll go to another place, they'll go listen to Shirk. They'll go to another place, listen to a friend who says Ali is God. And he'll think, eh, all of this is okay. 
It's a masjid. He's a khatib. We're listening to Islam. Your kid's iman is shaky. So as a father and as a mother, you have to truly understand what does it mean to follow tawheed. You like, look, look, this is, it, it's a very dangerous time we live in. Somebody on Facebook has 1 million fans. His YouTube channel has 500,000 subscribers. But then he's teaching people. I don't really follow any organized aqidah. I don't, I don't attribute myself to any aqidah. So what are you, man? So you have no aqidah? You're preaching somebody to the people openly. Right? This is public information. He's sitting there and telling people, I don't really attach myself to any aqidah. So, what, so you have no belief. You're not attaching yourself to any belief. What are you then? But he has a PhD before his name and everybody thinks, oh my God, Sheikh Dr. Fulan. And this guy is teaching people he does not associate with any aqidah. So he has no belief. And the kids are flocking to him because he's born and raised here. He speaks our lingo. He has the same type of jokes and habits, so everybody's mesmerized by him. But that's not the point. Luqman guarded his child's aqidah first and foremost. Tawheed, tawheed, tawheed. Then he goes to salah. Then what more bil ma'roof. All right. So now you're telling people what is good. Do you just stop there and run away? Nope. Wanha anil munkar. And tell people what is wrong. You can't just tell people good, 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 good. And you never talk about what is wrong. Allah could have just told us about the descriptions of Jannah. Anytime he brings up Jannah, immediately he talks about Jahannam. Anytime he brings up Jahannam first, immediately he talks about Jannah. He gives, up, gives us the clear image of the polar opposites. You have to know what is right and you also have to know what is wrong. This is the way Allah, ha this is the Sunnah of Allah. And this was also from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, he came to the people of Quraysh. They're making hajj, they're making dua, they're doing all sorts of things. These were rituals that people knew about from the time of Ibrahim alayhi but they lost it. When he came, uh, people were making tawaf around 300 plus idols. Inside the Kaaba were idols and idols. So they're not really making tawaf. The concept was there, but what they were doing is wrong. Instead of making tawaf to, for Allah's sake, they're making the tawaf for the sake of the idols that's there. Or they're making dua. Dua is something that you're supposed to do. But he's saying the person is making a dua to a tree or, or some grave or this or that. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I came to perfect or complete the manners of the people. You're making dua. The concept of dua is excellent, but let me complete and perfect it for you. The way you're making dua and to who you're making dua is wrong. You should be making dua to Allah. So command what is good and forbid what is evil. If you go and tell your children, hey, this is haram, 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 haram. Okay, baba wa mama, what's the halal thing that I'm supposed to do? You don't teach them what is the halal thing. You have to. So you tell somebody that music, musical instruments, singing, dancing, all this is wrong. What is the halal alternative? You have to explain to your child. You have to explain to the, uh, to the people. Let's go back. Somebody says he loves the Prophet ﷺ, that's why he wants to do the mawlid. And I tell him, brother, this is a bid'ah. Okay, what's the halal way for me to show my love to the Prophet? Let's explain. Let's sit and talk about that. So you give people all, everybody, the halal alternative. Something is wrong, but this is what is the good. Show them how to replace the negative thing that they had. So what more bil ma'roof? Wanha anil munkar. You speak the truth. Tell people what is right and you tell people what is wrong. Not be, remember we covered this before Ramadan started in one of the lectures. The Prophet ﷺ said that the man who has two faces, wajhain, one face with one person, another face with one person. On the day of judgment, he will be given two tongues. And that will be the sign that this was a two-faced person. A Muslim is supposed to have one face. He teaches his son exactly that. Doesn't matter what you do, how small it is, even if it's under a rock, Allah will bring it forth. So you live for Allah. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ You speak the truth, command what is good, and you forbid what is evil. Like it who like it, hate it who hate it. But as a Muslim, this is who you have to be. So you can't be shot at the sight of evil. You cannot be those people 
sweet talkers. That's the word I was looking for. He, he comes to you, sweet talks you to the point he'll make you seem like, oh man, he loves me so much, he's with me. Then he'll go to your enemy, not forget your enemy. He'll go to the enemy of Allah, sweet talk with him and be with them. And then and this person, I mean, come on. A Muslim cannot be that way. A Muslim has to have one face. You live for Allah. Whatever it is that we say or do, even if we're hiding underneath a rock, يَأْتِ بِهَ Allah. I have to command what is good. I have to forbid what is evil. This is the way life is. So look at Luqman that he's teaching his son all of this. All of this. The father is teaching his child. Then he says, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أصابك. Be patient when you are faced with calamities. Don't, don't we know about children? They're super A grade students. They, get great, great, uh, they did good in their SATs and all that stuff. But his favorite college, her favorite college, for whatever reason, by the Qadr of Allah, he or she did not get accepted. Oh my God, this child is devastated. And then they start thinking, why did Allah do this to me? I was working so hard for all these years. This hasn't happened. This it is the parents who did, uh, who did not do a good job in raising this child to deal with trials and tribulations. So Luqman is teaching his son, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا عَصَابَكَ And he says this when, command to people what is good and forbid what is evil. Then he says, be patient when trials befall you. What's the wisdom? Son, when you tell people what's right and wrong, believe me, they will come after you and hunt you like a wild dog. So when they harm you, when they attack you, when they plot and plan against you, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا عَصَابَكَ be patient with the trials you face from the people. Because most people, they don't like being told what is correct in terms of Allah and His Messenger. So you're going to face a lot of backlash. When that happens, be patient. And of course, secondly, in life in general, not everything will go your way. This is why it's so important as a father and mother. Yeah, a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, we understand we are supposed to have rahmah. This kid is screaming, crying, this, that. But every time your son or daughter screams, you give him exactly what he wants. Have you taught him the consequences of his actions? Has he understood the concept of not always things will go your way? Many things in life will turn out the exact opposite of what you wish for. How will this child learn to cope with loss? The parent teaches this. In life as a Muslim, we need sabr. It could be a halal thing. It may not work out. I've seen, read in newspapers, somebody uh, doesn't get accepted in that engineering school. It, this happens in Muslim countries because, you know, uh, a lot of parents, again, education is very important. But a lot of Muslim parents, they think once you get educated, the whole dunya will be solved. The ummah will succeed. You will attain Jannah. The ummah will never succeed without Tawheed. The ummah will never succeed without submission to Allah. That's how we get our success. We have so many PhDs. Look at what's going on. Have you been following the news? CNN, Fox, whatever it is. Even a place like Bigot News, like Fox News. During this COVID-19 attack, how many Muslim doctors have shown up on the news? Giving their expert opinions what to do with the patients. Then you truly realize how many Muslim doctors we have in this country. Every day, there's a female Muslim doctor, a male Muslim doctor coming on CNN, Fox News, telling us what to do. Because at the end of the day, there are many Muslims in America who are doctors, engineers, lawyers, Allahumma barik, lahum. But how many Muslim Muslims do we have? We have Muslim doctors. We have doctors who are, happen to be Muslim named, but they don't know anything about Islam. That doesn't bring success for our ummah. So be a doctor, but be a strong Muslim doctor. Be an engineer, but be a strong Muslim engineer. So you make an impact in your life and the uh, life of the people around you. But anyways, the point is, wasbir ala ma asabak. So I've seen in Muslim countries, somebody goes, he doesn't uh, get admitted to that great engineering school. He kills himself. Subhanallah. He committed suicide because he couldn't get into that one university. There's like a hundred other universities. 
But that's how he got brainwashed. Doesn't know how to cope with life. A woman watching Bollywood movies falls in love with some guy who happens to be her neighbor. My parents are not letting me marry him. I will kill myself. And they hang him her, herself. Or a boy will jump off a bridge. I can't marry. My father said I can't marry the girl I love. I'll kill myself. What's wrong with you people? That this is what life is? A degree and a woman and a man? That's how easy it is for you to throw away your akhirah? They don't know how to cope with loss. They don't know. This is a musibah that has struck your life, but you don't know how to deal with it? So many of our youth, they lose their Islam because they faced a trial, simple trial as not getting accepted at a college. A simple trial as not being able to marry somebody that they wanted. That's it. This is more than enough for me to give up Allah. Why? Because they did not learn from their house. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Be patient. Right? Be patient. Sometimes we find people. I'll, I'll uh, you know, yesterday one of the brothers was asking, what's your favorite sport? Uh, and I, I said, American football, soccer and cricket. The fourth one would be basketball. You know, alhamdulillah, Allah, is, you know, Allah gives to some and doesn't give to others. Uh, in my high school, I was a very good athlete, right? I had a, okay, I thought, okay, let me choose one of these sports, I'll go professional. In middle school, I played wide receiver. In high school, I played basketball. Then I did some parts of high school back in Bangladesh because my parents didn't want me to do everything in America and learn this whole thing. All right, when I went there, that's when I learned cricket. I was really good at it. I played in the school team and everything. And I was thinking, okay, you know what? I'm going to be a professional athlete. But Allah has better choices for me, better ideas. Am I going to, oh man, my dream is lost. I'm going to quit life. It doesn't work this way. Because your children have to be taught. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't do this. Wasbir ala ma asabak. So you have to know. You have to keep your options open. As a believer, you're wise. So the parent comes in and teaches this to your child. But what do we do? Son, daughter, you can study anything in this world as long as it's medicine or engineering. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is how we start. No, there could be something else that your son and daughter truly loves. It's a halal field. It's a halal field. They will excel in it. Let them progress in what they love. Right? What's the problem? Maybe your son wants to be a his historian. What's, what's wrong with it? Maybe your daughter wants to be, uh, I, I don't know, what is it that sisters are into without other than engineering, forcefully, of course, right? So a halal field. So they could excel in it. Let them feel in the, like success. That let them feel the sakina in their heart while they're doing something in life. Look at these researchers that, uh, that is always done. Maximum majority of the people are upset with their jobs. Even those who are earning six-figure salaries, they're sad with their job because that's not what they wanted to do in life. Maybe he wanted to do something else. So as a Muslim parent, don't be this way. Let your child exceed in what they feel, what they love, what they are interested in. However, fix the Islam first. Go do whatever it is. But you have to be a Muslim first and foremost. Then go be the lawyer, the engineer, the doctor, the teacher. Uh, the, uh, maybe you want to be uh, a coach. Maybe one of the brothers is interested in being a coach, uh, 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 you know, coach for some sports or in school. What's the problem? We need Muslims in every field, every halal field, right? So fix their Islam, help them build their aqidah, their practice of Islam first. Then you teach them about life. And before we end for the night, Wasbir ala ma asabak. Sabr has three levels. You have to be patient while fulfilling the commands of Allah. You have to be patient while staying away from that which is forbidden from Allah. And thirdly, we you have to be patient while dealing with the trials of life. What's far do you have to be patient? Like this month of Ramadan, it's all about patience. We're gonna see people drinking, eating. Right. Uh, of course, now we're stuck in our home, so it's not all the time we're outside. We see the non-Muslims eating and drinking. It's patience. You need sabr. Man, I'm fasting. The guy's eating in front of me. Be, have patience while you're fulfilling an obligation. Then haram. All these uh, haram things look so nice and glamorous, calling you to it. Be patient and stay away from it. And then, of course, when the musibah, the trials and tribulations come 
fall, befall you because Allah will test you. وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ And we test you with evil and good. When evil befalls you, you seek Allah's forgiveness, you ask Allah's help. When good befalls you, you have to make shukr to Allah. You have to. That's the trial when good things happen. So, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ uh, وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ So good stuff and bad stuff. Bad stuff, both are a fitna. It's a trial. Because Allah wants to see what you do. In, and then Luqman ends, إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ These are the commandments of Allah. Aqidah, Iman, Salah, commanding what is good, forbidding what is evil, being patient. These are the commands of Allah. ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ These are the commandments which require a strong determination. A weak person will not fulfill these commands. So he's teaching his son, you have to be a strong believer, my son. If you are a weakling, guess what? Life is too hard. The shaitan is too difficult. He is true, uh, uh, too deceptive. He, he'll, he'll misguide you. You have to be strong, strong-willed and determined that this is what I'm going to stick to. You, don't, you will not be a sellout to your religion. You will not be a sellout to the Prophet ﷺ. What happens? Somebody may come, Hey, man, I'll give you a few dollars. Oh, what is it that you want me to do? Halal, haram, he doesn't care. Hey, I'll add a title before your name. What, 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 boss? What do you want me to do? This, these are sellouts who have no personality. You're supposed to be strong-willed and determined. What مُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ you have to command what is good and forbid what is evil. Be strong-willed and determined. So inshallah ta'ala will end with this verse. And of course the advice of Luqman is still not finished. We'll cover more of what he says to his son uh, inshallah tomorrow. So let's uh, get to the questions. Uh, sisters probably want to go to fa for fashion industry. No, no, the, you have. <laughs> if you think that way, you're not going to get married anytime soon. Uh, alhamdul alhamdulillah, there are many sisters who are very anti the fashion industry. And uh, alhamdulillah, and may Allah bless them uh, for that. Okay, let's see. If a person gets away from Islam, then comes back, does he repeat the shahada? Um, yeah, of course, if he leaves Islam, comes back, he wants to renew his faith, he enters back properly, uh, he would go through the whole process uh, I, I, again. But it is some. It, it depends on what is the situation. Now, if somebody is in, entered into Islam, he gave up Salah, Siyam, but he did not give up his belief. He didn't say, uh, of course, we know giving up Salah is... Uh, is a major kufr, uh, but the point is what I'm saying is the person didn't denounce Allah, right? It's not that he completely left Islam, went to a different religion, he just stopped practicing. That's a bad Muslim, he comes back. But someone who enters into Islam, leaves the religion completely, switches a different religion, becomes an atheist, whatever it is, he's just jumping around and exploring, as they say. And then he comes back, of course, he repeats. But th that time, the second time he comes back, we have to make sure we truly help this person in clarifying his doubts, uh, questions, and things like that, so he doesn't keep jumping in and out of Islam, because that's not obviously good. Uh, while fasting, can we use toothpaste uh, to brush? Yes, inshallah ta'ala, no problem. Uh, this is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi that brush your teeth. If you use the miswak, that's better for you, uh, but if you want to use toothpaste and toothbrush, no problem. Let's see. Can we cut our nails while fasting and can we cut our nails at night? Uh, of course, inshallah ta'ala, cutting nails has nothing to do with fasting or the night time. I know in certain cultures, <laughs> they have a silly story. Don't cut your nails at night, you're going to get blind, right? Or something like this, or you're going to lose your eyesight. Something to do with the eyesight. I don't know what the connection is, but that's, again, one of the... A very widespread folk tales that exist out there that's not true. You can cut your nails while you're fasting. You can cut your nails 
at night time, no problem. Uh, however, during Adha, Eid al Adha, if you are somebody who's going to offer a Udhiyah, the, the Prophet وسلم, said, do not cut your nails until, for those 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, you don't cut your nails until after you have done the slaughtering. So, right before Dhul Hijjah starts, the night before, you can cut your nails, and then for the next 10 days, you don't. So, that's attached to Eid um, uh, al Adha, nothing to do with Ramadan. All right, I see a lot of yes. Uh, just uh, a humble request, inshallah. If anybody types a question, just uh, leave it for me to answer that, inshallah. But unless I know uh, some, t there are other students of knowledge that sometimes tune in. If it's one of those brothers who want to answer, by all means, it's fine. I don't have a problem. Uh, but uh, the lay people from the community, just inshallah, uh, avoid answering people's questions. Let's see. How long will the day of judgment be? Uh, it's a question from Yusuf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, in Surah Ma'arij that the day of judgment is equal to 50,000 years of our lifetime. They say this is only two, the year 2020, right? So one day, Yawmul Qiyamah is equal to 50,000 years of our life. So it's a very lengthy day. That, that's why Allah will bring forth everything. He's going to judge all these billions of human beings about every little detail that we said and did. Uh, okay, let's see. What is it? The Muslim population is growing everywhere. Don't you think the demand of scholars will increase? Of course, this is anywhere. Uh, like even in this town, Right, there's what, probably 10,000 Muslims. We don't see all of them, but I'm sure when the, by the looks of it, uh, it's, there's probably, probably 10,000 Muslims in South Jersey. Even if there were 100 people like me, I would say Alhamdulillah and I would welcome them with open arms because we have lots of people to help. Lots of people. It is, it's not possible for one person to equally give attention to all, all the Muslims who are suffering. There's a huge shortage. That's the problem. There's a huge shortage in the Ummah today uh, about actual ulama. The true scholars of Islam are just getting fewer and fewer. And of course, also sincere uh, tulab and du'at who are teaching the Sunnah, teaching Tawheed and helping people. There, it's, it's just you know one of the signs of the Day of Judgment that these things uh, will decrease. And evil will become widespread. But you want to find singers, dancers, people calling to haram, people telling you to do all sorts of things. Subhanallah, never ending supply. Right? These are the trials. The closer we get to the day of judgment, these, this will only keep on uh, getting worse. It, will it count if you read the Quran on a digital device? Uh, 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 yeah, I, um, this question was asked last night as well, but I'm sorry I actually missed it. Um, even if you read the Quran on a digital device, it counts. You get the same reward of 10 hasanat for each harf, each letter that you uh, read. Just like people do jinn and shaitan uh, uh, and Satan uh, die. All right. Yes, everything has a lifespan. Iblis is different. Iblis is going to be put into Jahannam through eternity. He's going to be here all the way till the day of judgment trying to influence the people. Uh, but jinns also have a lifespan. It's not that a jinn is going to live forever, right? Um, just so you know, just like human beings, not every human is a Muslim, not every human is a kafir. Within the humans, we have Muslims, we have Hindus, we got this, we got that. Just like that, not when we, when we say the word jinn, it doesn't automatically by default mean shaitan. Jinn is that species of creation. From the jinn kingdom are shayateen, the devils. This is why Allah said in the Quran, the prophets have enem um, enemies from the shayateen, from the devils from where? Min uh, al-ins uh, jinn. Uh, they have enemies from the devils within mankind and jinn. We have human devils. This is not a term that is like is harsh. Allah has coined this term. So we can use it. There are human devils, those who fight the religion, 
those who fight the houses of Allah, those who fight the callers to Allah, those who fight against those who want to practice Islam properly. So those are the devils among mankind. Uh, what is hasanat? Hasana means one good deed. Hasanat is three or more good deeds. Are there any pictures of jinns? Uh, no, if Allah forbid, if you see, start seeing images of jinns, you have some other problem, uh, right? You'll have to find somebody to do ruqya on you. So there's no pictures of jinns. Uh, what Hollywood and Disney and all these other things portray, uh, this is, you know, they are following shaitan's path, so maybe they get influenced to come up with these images. Uh, but those don't think that, oh, the jinn is a short green goblin-like creature. <laughs> right? So jinns have their features, but don't uh, get uh, confused by these. All right, uh, Brother Nadim is back with another jinn possession question. Yes, I have seen uh, plenty of, uh, he's asking if I've ever, ever seen anyone possessed by jinn here in the U.S. And as I said, yeah, uh, it's not a good experience, but alhamdulillah, uh, yes, I have seen uh, quite a few people uh, being possessed. All right, now we're going off topic. Let's stick to the topic. We, we can talk about jinns later. Okay. Uh, what else is here? Are there any special du'as we can do before we start iftar? That's one of the times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts du'a right before iftar. So before you get uh, sit down for your iftar, you should take that time to uh, make du'a. Right? You're sitting and waiting to break your fast. Make as much du'a as you want. Anything. Anything. There's no specific du'a. The specific du'a is when you're breaking your fast. That ذَهَبَ الظَّمَاء وَابْتَ اللَّتِ الْعُرُوكُ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ inshaAllah. This is, a this is the hadith in Abu Dawood. Um, this is the specific du'a for breaking the fast. So you're, making your, you're taking your iftar, you say Bismillah, you take a bite, take a sip of the water, then you say this. Because the du'a means uh, that um, the, the hunger and the thirst is gone, uh, the, the veins are moist because you have dr drunk water now. Um, and the reward is assured by the will of Allah. So, of course, that makes o that only makes sense once you have taken your bite. You don't just say that first. You haven't drank. You haven't eaten. You haven't felt the moistness of the water yet. So, drink it. Say Bismillah and drink it. Take the bite from the date. Then you say, as you're doing it, you say this dua. So, that's the specific dua of iftar. But before iftar, you can make any dua that you uh, like. <laughs> A lot of people say God instead of Allah. Is it okay to say God? When we're talking with non-Muslims, you want to interchange. Uh, you want to interchange the uh, word for them to understand. That's fine. This is part of da'wah. Like even Alhamdulillah, uh, myself and many others better than me. Uh, whenever we're doing da'wah work with non-Muslims, uh, we'll use Allah, we'll explain what it means, and we keep interchanging Allah, God, Allah, God, so they know we're talking about the same being, uh, because a lot of times they're confused, they think, because that's what the media, the fake news of the media portrays, that uh, Allah is something different, it's the moon God, or the Kaaba itself is Allah, so many times when a non-Muslim hears the word Allah, he thinks it's something else, no, God is Allah, uh, this is in Arabic, so you should explain it to him. Now, as we mentioned, one of our sisters asked the other night, what is the greatest name of Allah? Is Allah. So do not shy away from teaching people the name of Allah. What is Allah? And, uh, and we can, inshallah, just one minute. Allah is Al-Ilah, the deity, the only deity, right? We are saying La ilaha illallah. There, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Al-Ilah, the one true deity Al-ilah, Allah. This is how we get the word. So he has to know this, or she has to know this. What, in comparison to the word God, God can be capital letter G, small letter G. God can be gods, plural, or God singular. God can be male, or it can be goddess. So gender, plurality, 
capital, small letter, whatever it is. But the name Allah is unique. There is no, you don't change according to gender. You don't change according to uh, a plural or this or that. Allah is Allah. This is his greatest name. So a person has to understand why we say Allah, because it has a meaning. This is the one true deity, the only deity. You don't assign male, female genders. You don't assign uh, plural pluralism to him and this and that. He is singular. Al-Ahad. He is Allah. He is unique. So even the name has tremendous benefit and, and meaning. Of course, it's, it's Allah's name, Allah. So you should explain to a non-Muslim uh, why we stick to this word Allah and what is what does it mean. But uh, while you are in the process of explaining, you want to interchange with God, that's fine. But as a Muslim, like, again, these are things that your children should be in the habit of. Like you will find kids growing up, oh my God, goodness, right, right? These are not expressions that as a Muslim, you should be saying. As a Muslim, I'm not saying it's haram, you, you said it, but what is better for you as a Muslim? Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, right? La ilaha illallah. These are the words a Muslim should utter. Not, oh my God. And of course, don't ever say, Jesus. I've seen kids even in our masjid, because they go to public school, they're not realizing what they're saying. Something happens in front of them, Jesus, you uttered a word of shirk. Why are you calling Jesus? This is shirkul akbar, right? So you have to be very careful. Your kids are growing up, going to these public schools and colleges. It is, even without them realizing, words of shirk are becoming their habit. We don't cry out to Jesus. We cry out to Allah. Um, so this is something very uh, important. All right, let's see. Last uh, two questions. <clears throat> Can I volunteer to Dawa events after this quarantine? Uh, sh sure, inshallah ta'ala. This is our volunteering in the community and we would love to see more of the teenage brothers and sisters and college-going brothers and sisters getting involved because this is what a Muslim community is about. So it's good that one of our young brothers asked this question. Any place you go to, any place, right? And this is the reality of life. Even if you go to a deviant place where, you know, and I mean like the far deviant, people are singing and dancing and going, going nuts. Even in those masajid, youth are leading the way. You go to a Shia shrine in America anywhere, they're beating themselves, whatever they're doing. You will see youth Shia organizing, helping, leading the way. No matter what group of People you go to, whether they are uh, on the Sunnah and Tawheed or complete Batil Aqidah, they have the future generation in the front and they are stepping up and they're con every community thinks about their future, except for this one, subhanAllah, right? Uh, it's like some people want, once we die, I hope every Muslim in this city dies too and the masjid burns to the ground. I mean, come on. Because if somebody has a vision, he will every day work to make sure some of the youth are growing up to carry this message to maintain these structures. You can't be selfish and think it's only me, and if it's not me, who cares, right? That's why some of them, they get angry. It's me. Okay, brother, what's going to happen when you die? It's not if. Death is not if. It's when. We will all die. They don't even want to think about death. Well, that's a problem between you and Allah. So don't be like that. We want young people to step up. Uh, and there's a reason, and I'll end with this, because these are things, like I said, well, I, maybe uh, so, somebody might think I'm sounding a little bit annoyed since last night, because, wallah, it is, it is very frustrating. After this month Ramadan ends, I don't want to see the same garbage, just like you guys don't want to see this nonsense. We, we need to move on. We, we need to move on. And, and so, personally speaking, this is the first time I have been in any city in any city in my whole Dawah career, I've been here for 27 months. I have done not even one non-Muslim Dawah program. I don't like this. I'll be accountable to Allah. This is the first time in my life in America that I went to a city. There is no Dawah program for non-Muslims because nobody thinks about it. Everybody is worried about who's going to be in management. 
if you want to be like that, go back to where you came from. You cannot live like that and be a Muslim in America. We have a responsibility to carry the message of Islam and to make sure people follow Islam. That's our job. We have to focus on Islam, right? So this is good. It's good that we want to see our young brothers and sisters getting involved and we want to make sure the future is preserved. We will all die. When I die, I want my son and daughter to learn Islam, to teach, to work for Islam. So I have to raise them that way, right? So inshallah ta'ala, uh, please uh, take this Ramadan to sincerely make dua for yourselves, your families, and our community, right? We don't want to move backwards. We want to move forwards with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise the banner of La ilaha illallah. Uh, so anyways, inshallah, we'll stop here for tonight and we will continue uh, with the um, uh, advice of Luqman to his son uh, tomorrow again, 9 p.m. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept everyone's siyam, their qiyam, all the du'as. May Allah forgive our sins and rectify our affairs. Subhanakallah bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.